It would appear that I poked the proverbial bear when I talked about BYU's quarterback recruiting situation on yesterday's podcast. So what is a good podcaster going to do? We're going to go right back to the well and talk about that, answer your questions you lobbed at me about BYU quarterbacks, and also talk about the latest with Mark Pope and Kentucky. It's all ahead on today's show. You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everybody? I'm Jay Catch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, your resident BYU insider. Thank you for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. I appreciate all of you who are everydayers with us right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. The motto around these parts is your team every day, and as such, we are your original daily podcast focused on all things BYU sports. And a big thank you once again for tuning in. All right. Uh, for those of you who are everydayers, yesterday we talked about BYU's quarterback situation. Grady Adamson, a highly thought of uh, quarterback prospect in the 2025 recruiting cycle, opted to commit to Georgia Tech yesterday. And in essence, uh, through BYU's quarterback situation, based on what I know, in uh, a bit of a tailspin. And the biggest uh, concern was, is can Aaron Roderick and the BYU staff, can they course correct and find themselves back on the right side of some of these recruiting losses they have had, particularly when it comes to recruiting quarterbacks in the past couple of recruiting cycles? Now, a number of you were upset with the way I approach things, and I, hey, I welcome all feedback. Let me be very clear about this. Good, bad, or indifferent, I appreciate it all, and I take it all in stride. I've learned in 15 years of doing sports radio that you are never going to have everybody on your side. Side. And then many times you have a lot of people that don't uh, like the side that you're on, but that's the point of what we do here in sports. We debate, we talk, we need, we, we go back and forth and that's, that's the fun part about this. So a uh, big question that was uh, lobbed at me was, uh, is Aaron Roderick going to be able to survive past this season? I had a number of people in our locked on Cougars insider group, uh, send me text to that effect. And a couple of you, I uh, mentioned it on social media and DMS and the like, and the simple fact of the matter is I am not a proponent of the quote unquote fire a rod cloud, a uh, crowd, excuse me. I have been a proponent of Aaron Roderick, I think, being one of BYU's best assets on Kalani Satake's staff. I understand that, yes, it has been a rough go with regards to finding a quarterback prospect out of the high school ranks in the past two recruiting cycles. That's obviously going to lead to angst for the BYU fan base. And the current uh, quarterback situation in terms of the, the overall talent base it feels like in that quarterback room, I can understand why you might be feeling a little bit about uh, why Aaron Roderick quote unquote, has his job still. Here's the deal. Aaron Roderick has sent uh, two quarterbacks and potentially three here in the next uh, few weeks to the NFL. That is a bona fide production that you cannot argue with. He sent Zach Wilson, Jaron Hall to the NFL via the NFL draft. It appears that Keaton Slovis is more than likely going to be an undrafted free agent, but even then he could be the third straight quarterback that has come and played under Aaron Roderick to end up in the NFL. Those of you who say that he was not re- he was not recruiting Zach Wilson and or Jaron Hall, I, I just can't. I'll just say this: y'all are wrong about that. Jaron Hall had options when he home, came home off of his mission to go to other places, and Aaron Roderick helped seal the deal to bring him to BYU. Zach Wilson, yeah, he may not have been officially on staff when Zach was being recruited, but I can tell you the connection that Aaron Roderick had with the Wilson family played a major role in Zach ultimately opting to go to BYU. So yes. You have to acknowledge what Aaron Roderick's production has been in the past and why I believe that he is an asset for this BYU coaching staff. We also can acknowledge the reality that right now BYU's quarterback situation is not all that great. I look at BYU's quarterback room right now, and I would list the top four being Jake Retzloff, Gary Bohannon, Trayson Borgay, and then Cade Fennigan as your top four options for BYU. And let's also be honest, and I'll also echo something that uh, Jeff Hansen wrote yesterday from Give him, for Give Him Hell Brigham, uh, is that does that room engender much confidence in the BYU uh, situation going into year two of the Big 12 Conference? No, it does not. But it is the hand that BYU has been dealt is the hand they're going to have to play. And you better hope that one of those guys, my money's still on Jake Retzloff being that guy, leading the way for BYU in 2024 and doing just enough with the weapons around him, particularly I think a very strong wide receiver core. I think an outstanding group of tight ends and hopefully a resurgent running game 
leading the way to BYU getting back to six wins in the postseason. That's the goal for BYU this season. It's not to be a Big 12 contender. That's If you think the BYU should be contending for Big 12 supremacy year two in the conference, uh, I've got some land and I got, I got some beachfront property in Alaska I'd like to sell, sell you. Uh, here, here's the deal. It's not a great quarterback situation, but it can change very, very quickly. And how does it go about changing that? And I'll answer the question that uh, Trevor uh, sent to me via our Locked On Cougars Insider Group. Jake, Jake, does BYU actually need to bring in a quarterback in this recruiting cycle? Because they have nine guys on the roster right now. Now, it, to answer that straight up, BYU does not quote unquote need to bring in a quarterback in the 2025 recruiting cycle. They do not need to do that per se, but Aaron Roderick's own words will be used against him right now. He says, I am going to bring in a quarterback every recruiting cycle to make sure that that room is always fully stocked. Now, Nine guys, it is bloated. There's way too many guys in that quarterback room, but more than half of those guys are currently walk-ons and I think are very quickly going to find out where they stand with regards to their status with the BYU football program and whether that's position changes, transfer portal exits, or simply just hanging up the cleats for the last time. You're going to see some guys exit this football program. So, uh, to answer Trevor's question, I don't think you necessarily need to take somebody in 2025, but I would expect BYU has plenty of time here. It's still April. Yet again, it is still April. There's still plenty of time for BYU to go out there in this evaluation period upcoming and also out throughout the summer when it comes to their camp series to identify some extra talent and go out and recruit it and hopefully sign a guy that they think can come in and compete for a starting position. The good news is, if you want to look at it that way, is that Jake Retzloff, should he win the quarterback job this year for BYU, has two years of eligibility. So he would cover up for the 2024 and 2025 seasons, allowing you to essentially sit back and be patient and let things play out and find the right guy for you. Now, if Gary Bohannon ends up being the guy, we only have the one year, and then you're probably dipping back into the portal or trying to find a stopgap of some sort to fill in for 2025. I think the ideal scenario for BYU quarterback-wise is to have Jake Retzloff start this year next year then you get whoever it might be Noah Lugo Trayson Borgay who has shown flashes in his time at BYU so far one of those guys steps in for that 2026 season maybe 2027 and then Enoch Watson a guy that the BYU staff is very very high on I think is excited for his future he gets home off of a mission and then you see what happens now I say all of that by adding the caveat that the transfer portal exists and it exists for a reason. There could be additions via the portal and also guys leaving uh, via the portal that could hurt or help BYU circumstance at quarterback. But alas, 2024 is what it's going to be. The other question that has been lobbed at me by a few different people, I'll give credit to Dave on our Locked On Cougars Insider group is the one who I'm going to address straight on is, Jake, BYU is very high on Ryder Burton and brought him into this football program. Where is Ryder Burton in the mix? Frankly, I don't think Ryder Burton's in the mix. I think that if Ryder Burton were anywhere near uh, being a playable quarterback or a guy that BYU thought could be an option for them at quarterback, he would have made that move this spring. As it stands right now, like I said, my top four for BYU at quarterback is Jake Retzloff, a junior college transfer, Gary Bohannon, a graduate seventh-year senior, and then Trayson Borgay, a, a walk-on transfer from Western Michigan, and then Cade Fennigan, who also is a former transfer from Boise State. Ryder Burton exists beyond that. Whether it's fifth string, sixth string, I do not know where he stands, but it appears that he is far down this pecking order, and he is a guy that I am absolutely watching as a potential guy to leave via the transfer portal. He may opt to say, you know what, I need to go find a place for myself to play, and it may not be a BYU. So, Yes, there, there's a lot of consternation about BYU's quarterback situation. And a number of you, trust me, the feedback was across the board. And I, I, I once again, I truly appreciate it because it gives me a feel of how things are going out there in Cougar Nation. But I think the situation is that BYU is uh, playing the hand that they are dealt. They're going to make the best of the situation, hopefully this year. And the one thing that I think could absolutely help BYU's case frankly, is to have a guy like Jake Retzloff, even if he is a quote-unquote game manager, the best thing he can do as a quarterback this year for BYU is get the ball in the hands of the BYU playmakers. Jake Retzloff may not be that playmaker like a Zach Wilson or a Jaron Hall in the past, but he has guys on the outside. Uh, Keanu Hill at tight end. He's got Darius Laster at wide receiver, Chase Roberts, Cody Evans, Keelan Marion. On down the list of wide receiver, get the like, ball once again to Hill at tight end. Turn around and hand it off to a guy that I think is going to become a workhorse running back in LJ Martin along with the other running back 
quarterbacks in the mix there, including a young freshman in Pokai, Pokai Haunga, who I think is going to be a future star for BYU, and expected the BYU offensive line under the tutelage of TJ Woods, who I have been told is an absolute technician with regards to breaking it down and getting guys in his offensive line room. Just it breaks it down to the base level with these guys. Essentially, let's just use the analogy of tearing the house down to the foundation and then building it from there. That is what he has endeavored to do this offseason. It's obviously going to take some time for the offensive line to get on the same page as they work throughout this se- uh, summer and in training camp. But you heard Connor Pay last week on this podcast say that we are going to be working harder this spring and summer than we have in p- previous years. And he's taking it upon himself as a team captain to make sure that all of the guys in that offensive line room are accountable for what they are doing. So. It's not an ideal situation, once again. And you might be calling me verbose. You might be calling me uh, long-winded. But BYU is going to have to make the best of the quarterback situation as it stands. And the sincere hope is that Jake Retzloff wins that job and sets BYU up uh, for at least two years, it appears, of starter caliber play in the Big 12 Conference. It does enough for BYU to continue to progress as a football program. Meanwhile, Aaron Roderick, Fessy Satake, uh, Matt Mitchell, by the way, uh, there's some notion out there that BYU doesn't have a quarterback's coach. I, I don't think there's anything further from the truth. Matt Mitchell, he is an analyst on the BYU staff, but uh, essentially his title is a quarterback's coach. Yeah, he may not be able to do the on-field stuff and go out and recruit uh, at, like a regular uh, full-time assistant can do, but I'm telling you, Matt Mitchell is as ingrained and is in the know when it comes to BYU's quarterback situation as anybody. So that also is one other thing I probably should clarify here as well. So hopefully that answers some questions. If you've got more of them, I welcome them. Send them in via Facebook, send them in via Twitter, send them in via uh carrier pigeon. I don't care how you get them to me. I am happy to acknowledge them. I'm happy to address them and help you guys be a little bit smarter at BYU fans out there. That is my endeavor every single day right here on the podcast. All right, let's flip gears and talk some BYU basketball. Similar topic to yesterday as well. Mark Pope, what is the situation at Kentucky? Uh, Could he be in the mix there? Well, I had some conversations with some folks who are far more in the know on that than I am, and we'll talk about what they told me next right here on Locked on Cougars. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel, my friends. It is playoff time in the NBA and the NHL upcoming. Baseball is in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game, no matter what you're into, whether it's basketball, hockey, or baseball, or even futures when it comes to the NFL or college football. They've got it all for you guys. The best part is right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. It's $150, win or lose. Bet on everything that's from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks and everything in between all in an app that is safe, secure, and super easy to use. That's the best part about it. It's convenient. You can do it right in the comfort of your home, right there on that mobile device. We have to seem to have our noses in at all times. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel, FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make your first bet an automatic win. Once again, 150 bucks, win or lose, courtesy of our friends over at FanDuel. It's all courtesy, once again, of FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen today. I want to remind you guys, if you've been watching Fox Sports or ESPN, you've had to turn on the volume with all that shouting that seems to be going on from all the talking heads on those networks. I want you guys to make the switch to Locked On Sports today. It's a free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you every single day to bring you the top sports stories without all the screaming that goes on on the other networks. Locked On Sports today brings you can't miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube and also on the free Amazon Fire TV channels app right now as well. It's all part of the Locked On Podcast Network your team every day. All right. A couple of you had feedback for me yesterday when it came to talking about Mark Pope. And let me also acknowledge one thing right out of the shoot as well. Uh, I did screw up where UTRGV, where Cahill Fennell was hired at uh, UTRGV uh, over the weekend. Uh, I I mistakenly uh, pointed out that I believe that UTRGV was in Brownsville. It appears they have a satellite campus in Brownsville, but the main campus for UTRGV is actually in Edinburgh, Texas, about about an hour away. So, uh, Danny I'm, and Danny Holmgren in particular, thank you for the clarification there and uh, correcting uh, me on that. And by the way, uh, it was good to see pictures of Coach uh, Fennel uh, landing down there uh, and obviously getting it started with his new endeavor as the head coach at UTRGV. Well, the guy he uh, previously worked for, Mark Pope, he has remained in the headlines locally, obviously, and there's been some mention of him in national circles with regards to the Kentucky opening uh, after John. Calipari is 
all but done in terms of being signed, sealed, and delivered by the time you listen and or watch this podcast. It may be officially announced by Arkansas, but he's going there on an $8 million plus deal with incentives that could push it north of $10 million. And oh, by the way, an NIL package that apparently is six plus million dollars. Yeah, Coach Cal is going to have uh, just a treasure trove of assets to work with uh, with Arkansas. But uh, Kentucky, it is one of the truest of the blue blood basketball programs out there. And a number of people locally have been talking about the chances Mark Pope get, could get in the mix. Now, I talked about it yesterday that I believe that he is down the list. It would take some notable names, uh, chief among them, I think a guy like Nate Oates in particular, uh, to move aside and essentially say they're staying put where they're currently coaching for a guy like Mark Pope to get the option to coach Kentucky. Well, Nate Oates is already out of the way. He made a statement that seemed to indicate that he is planning on sticking around at Alabama. And I can't blame him, by the way. He just led Alabama to the first ever Final Four. Why do you want to uproot that and try and go into the pressure cooker that is Kentucky? But there are going to be a bevy of other coaches who are interested in this. Uh, based on the conversations I had with some folks yesterday, expect for Kentucky to swing for the quote-unquote fences with this hire. Try and get the likes of a Danny Hurley. Now, Danny Hurley, UConn, it's a dynasty there. I don't think he's leaving stores Connecticut anytime soon. Nate Oates, I already mentioned, is a guy that would have been easily uh, at the top of that list, but it appears he's sticking around at Alabama, but then you move down the list to other guys uh, and you look at it and say, okay, situation is, is that Kentucky has all the resources that any basketball coach in their right mind would be absolutely giddy to have in their back pocket. But you also have to go into that job knowing what you're going up against. Now, I also give a credit. Uh, Jeff Hansen does a great job. If you have not been reading and or listening to Give Him Hell, Brigham, you are missing out. I listen uh, to and read a lot of uh, Jeff's work, especially when it comes to his Give Him Hell, Brigham stuff. And he pointed something, that, something out very poignant that I think that is going to essentially uh, – not uh, eliminate Mark Pope from contention for the Kentucky job, but make it, I think, an uphill climb for him ultimately to land the job this go-round. And he pointed this out. Eddie Sutton had taken Arkansas to a Final Four. Rick Pitino took Providence to a Final Four before going uh, to the Knicks and then ultimately landing it to Kentucky. Tubby Smith took Georgia to the Sweet 16. Billy Gillespie took Texas A&M to the Sweet 16 and a top 10 AP uh, top 25 season. And then John Calipari, oh, by the way, took UMass Memphis to the Final Fours before, before being hired at uh before being hired at UK what does Mark Pope lack on his resume it is success in the postseason and some of it is his fault other parts of it aren't because you can't necessarily control all the controllables when it comes to postseason success but he is over as a head coach in the NCAA tournament I have a hard time believing that Kentucky fans, no matter how much of a favorite son he is, and that was something that was pointed out to me as well, is that Mark Pope is considered to be one of the chief guys, or like a heart and soul type guy of that 1996 Kentucky National Championship team. He was a guy who was beloved down there, and he's got connections still to the university to this day, and that obviously will play in his favor. But the track record says in, in terms of getting hired to Kentucky, you got to have proven that you had high level success at other programs before landing at Kentucky. I'm going to echo something that Patrick Kinahan, who I work with on a daily basis at 97.5, the KSL sports zone tune in from six to 10 DJ and PK. We've been working with that show for 10 years now. He pointed this out as well is that uh, this may not be the go around for Mark Pope to get that job at Kentucky. Now let's say whoever does get the job, maybe it's Scott drew, for example, from Baylor. Scott has been at a Baylor forever and he seems like an institution there in Waco, but maybe he does get the the itch to say, you know what? I'm going to give another shot. Uh, maybe uh, get, take another shot at another program and takes that job at Kentucky. Well, maybe he goes in flames out there or he has some success and decides he wants to do something different. Maybe jump to the uh, NBA, for example, et cetera. No matter what it is, the next time that Kentucky is hiring, Mark Pope is young enough right now, uh, relative in terms of the coaching circles, that he could miss out on the job this time. Get in a meeting room with uh, uh, UK Brass, the Wildcats' uh, top decision makers, Mitch Barnhart, their AD, among others, and make a positive impression that when and if that job opens up again and Mark Pope is back on uh, the interview list, that's when I think Mark Pope would get this job. I don't think he gets this go around unless they have just a, a slew of people decide that they are not interested in taking that position. And then Mark Pope gets that opportunity. I was also told, uh, told, excuse me, expect that Mark Pope will interview for this job, whether it's a courtesy interview because he is a UK alum and, and the Wildcats want to take care of their own. I don't know what that is, but as I was also told by another person when I was talking about that, is that Mark Pope is a salesman of the highest order. That was a direct quote I got from saying He is a salesman of the highest order, and if he gets behind closed doors with uh, Kentucky uh, brass, I'll use that term again, 
he could really charm them and uh, maybe wiggle his way that way. Like I said, I, I don't see it happening. Dose go around for Mark Pope, but he could be laying the seeds for years down the line, maybe four or five years down the line, that he ultimately gets his dream and gets to go to his alma mater and coach at Kentucky. Now, in the interim, if he doesn't get the job, Mark has got to get things going, obviously, with the BYU basketball program. And that is where I want to finish off uh, talking about BYU basketball here for today is that John Fanta, who is a, a preeminent uh, national college basketball voice, does things on the Big East Network, FS1, the Field of 68. You can find him everywhere. John's on Twitter. Uh, John underscore Fanta does a really, really good job. He also writes for Fox Sports. Well, he uh, put out a top, uh, a way too early top 25 uh, list, and he did it at halftime of the national championship game last night. Well, I decided, you know what? I'm going to prove that and see what we got on here. And looking at it, you start off, okay, number one is UConn. Okay, well, you know what? UConn, back-to-back -back national champs. You don't blame them. Duke, Kansas, Iowa State, Gonzaga, Arizona, Tennessee, Houston, Purdue, and then Marquette round out the top 10 of his uh, way too early top 25. Well, you scroll down just a little bit further, and there at number 21, rest the BYU Cougars. Folks, the hype train is real for BYU. Yes, it appears that Jackson Robinson is all but done at BYU. I, I've been talking about on this podcast for weeks now that I expected him to move on, whether that was to another program. I, I think it's more likely he goes pro than anything else in terms of just chasing his uh, fortune in the NBA, whether it is as a second-round draft pick or otherwise. Uh, and that leaves an opening in BYU's roster they're trying to fill via the transfer portal. And we talked about some of the targets yesterday. But the bigger point is, BYU brings back a ton of weapons and a ton of experience from this year's team that finished a surprising fifth place in the Big 12 Conference. That has yielded BYU being a top 25 uh, preseason team. That is hype. That is absolutely going to be something that BYU is going to have to deal with because I'm sure there are going to be other early top 25s that are going to come out uh, that may already come out and will come out in coming days. They'll have BYU in a similar circumstance. Mark Pope is going to have the stakes raised higher than they ever have before in his entire run at BYU, and it is time to put up or shut up when it comes to the postseason. BYU, since 1993, the only time they have advanced in the NCAA tournament is, oh, some guy named Jimmer Fredette. It's crazy to consider that that is the track record for BYU in the postseason, but they've got to overcome that and find a way to advance in the NCAA tournament. And if you're ranked 21st right now in the way too early top 25, you are firmly, firmly, uh, set to be in the field of the NCAA tournament next year. Now, is that a guarantee? No, it is not. You got to go out and obviously prove it with your play on the court. But uh, the hype train is starting to roll, folks. So get aboard. It should be an interesting season ahead for the BYU basketball program. All right, we will finish out this edition of Locked On Cougars coming up next by taking a look back at 1926 in BYU football history. Uh, a little bit of a crazy year for BYU, the second year of C.J. Hart, BYU's second all-time coach. Uh, things did not go according to plan, but there were two notable firsts against BYU's rivals that we need to talk about. We'll do that next right here on Locked On Cougars. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. Appreciate y'all being with us. I already mentioned it a couple of times on today's show, but I would encourage you guys, if you're not done so already, please join our Locked On Cougars insider group. I'm sharing insider tidbits the moment I'm hearing them and learning them and passing them along. Uh, the way to do it is just click it on the show notes in the links, uh, whether you're listening to this or watching it on YouTube. Uh, join us. 14-day free trial, $5 a month afterwards to be a part of it. And the way the updates come to you is via text messages directly to your phone. It's as simple as that, my friends. The best part is you can uh, text me right back and we can have conversations going back and forth. I love nothing more than having banter with our Locked On Cougars Insider group. And I welcome any and all banner uh, for those of our current uh, subscribers on that. But at the same time, if you'd like to join us, I'd love to have you guys on board as well. It's been a really, really fun venture and looking forward to many, many more chats to come here on the podcast. All right. As you round out today's show, let's look back at 1926 in BYU football history. Now, uh, the early history of BYU football, frankly, it sucked. <laughs> I don't want any other way to say it. BYU struggled mightily. Now, they had some established rivals in Utah and what was then Utah Agricultural College, now Utah State University, who have been playing football for literally decades when BYU finally uh, began playing intercollegiate football in 1922. Well, entering the 1926 season, BYU had finally reached the 500 plateau as a football program. And entering the second year under C.J. or Chick Hart as their head coach, the hope is that BYU could uh, pick some of that momentum up and carry it forward into this season. 
Well, it did not go according to plan. BYU started off the season facing off against their first ever opponent from California. Uh, and I, I remember I was reading about this. I'm like, hey, BYU played Cal in 1926. No, I, I was I was messed up on that. And I uh, big thank you, by the way, to BYU Stats, man, our good friend DJ. Uh, he has been helping me out with some of the intel on this from today. So, DJ, I, I owe you a, a, a platitude uh, of thanks for this. But he points out that uh, Cal, uh, the Cal Aggies that BYU faced in their opener in 1926 is actually what is known now as UC Davis of the Big Sky Conference. Well, BYU uh, struggled in this game when they hosted UC Davis and Provo losing 17-0. They followed it up a week later against Colorado uh, uh, teachers, uh, losing that game 12-6. to So, BYU off to an 0-2 start on the year. But but then the back-to-back, -back, uh, well, not the back-to-back, -back, the, the two uh, biggest games of BYU season obviously traditionally have been their rivalry games against Utah State and Utah. Well, the third game of the season, BYU welcomed Utah Agricultural College, now Utah State University, to Provo, Utah. Their second game against Aggies in, uh, in three weeks, and BYU notched their first ever non-loss to Utah State in this game. Ended up with a 0-0 tie. Yes, this is the era of ties, and somehow you can play to a 0-0 tie. And alas, BYU's first ever not a loss to Utah State. And frankly, uh, it was a struggle early on in BYU's history against both the Aggies and the Utah Utes. And we'll talk about how long the early... Uh, struggles against Utah uh, would be as things progress here. But then BYU bounced back the following week by beating up on their uh, annual, I don't know, here's the thing, Western State, the BYU played, they went to Gunnison, Colorado, where Western State was located in this era. Annually, you, BYU could guarantee they had one win in the bag, and that was against Western State. And alas, BYU got 30 to nothing was the final as they picked up their first and would ultimately be their only win of the season. So if you're keeping track at home as we talk about this, they are one, two, and one. One win, two losses, one tie. And then they welcome Montana State to BYU. Now, Montana State, as we all know, uh, was the home and the the ten, the the program that G. Ott Romney, who would uh, become BYU's head coach in short order, was coaching. Well, they came BYU went to, went up to Bozeman, excuse me, and got pummeled twenty seven nothing. And then the following week, the Utah Utes did what they had done early on in BYU's tenure as an intercollegiate football program. They laid the wood to BYU as well, forty to seven. It was uh, thirty something to nothing, but. The reemergence of Boney Fuller uh, came to the forefront in this game against Utah. I mentioned there were two firsts for BYU's rivals in this season. Well, first was not losing to Utah State, albeit in a 0-0 tie. And then for the first time uh, since BYU had added intercollegiate football uh, to their athletic department, BYU scored a touchdown against Utah. Who scored that touchdown? The one, the only, Livonia, you know him as Boney. Fuller. Yes, he was the only one. He uh, returned a fumble for a touchdown in that game. And our good friend DJ of BYU Statsman on Twitter did point out to me, and I had, I had this question yesterday on the podcast. I didn't know why Boney Fuller appeared on the roster in BYU's debut season in 1922, but then reappeared in 1925-1926. Well, uh, as uh, DJ pointed out, he was actually on a mission. So there were RMs, folks, that were playing at BYU, going on missions, then coming home and contributing to the BYU football program. Now, eligibility rules in the 1920s, probably a little different than they are currently, but Boney Fuller, a return missionary, uh, scored the first ever touchdown against the Utah Utes. If you want to stick to that in uh, Utah fans' uh, right eye, feel free to do with it what you will. But then the BYU finished off the season facing off against Colorado Agricultural College, which is Colorado State, ended up losing that game 19-6. to A really tough season for BYU. Final tally. One win, five losses, one tie. Not what BYU was expecting if they went three and three the previous year and was sitting at 500 and was a mid-table finish uh, for BYU in that 1925 season. But 20, uh, 1926 did not go the way BYU wanted it to go. And ultimately, it would, I think it would cause BYU to think about, okay, is this what we're ultimately going to be forever? Honestly, because it was. It's, it, here's the deal. When I break down these seasons for BYU, I try and find fun tidbits about this and try and make it sound all rosy and the BYU was building something. Like I said at the start of, the, of, of this little clip here, it was 50 years of crap that BYU kind of waited their way through. Now, there were some high moments, and we'll get to those. There are actually some pretty high moments that are coming up in pretty short order relative to this. But the consistent winning program that you, uh, your, your grandpa, your dad, and maybe even your great-grandpa may uh, have synonymized BYU football with, that didn't exist for the first 50 years of BYU's football existence, frankly. It just it was a really, really tough slog as BYU tried to find the right mix of adding talent and obviously with BYU being a, a church school and finding the right coach. It just 
all of the things that BYU dealt with in building up this football program, it eventually culminated in 1972 at the fateful hire of a, of a, uh, let's put it this way. Lavelle Edwards was kind of a, a, a unknown commodity as a former high school coach and working as a defensive coordinator. Like you weren't sure what you're going to get out of him. Well, he yielded 50 years of pretty stellar play for BYU, all things considered, when you compare it especially to the first 50 years of BYU's football tenure as an intercollegiate football program. So 1926, not a great year. The hopes was that 1927 would yield better results, but uh, let's just put it this way. Yeah, there were some moments in 1927, but the record didn't really necessarily re reflect that. And we'll talk uh, more about that on our next edition of Locked on Cougar. So there you go. That's what I've got for you as about 1926. I wish I had more to say, but yes, Boney Fuller returning a fumble for a touchdown. That's a big moment. The first ever touchdown against Utah and then not losing to Utah State. Those are probably the two high moments or the high, two high points of the 1926 season as BYU uh, looked ahead to 1927 and beyond. And once again, we'll talk about that on tomorrow's edition of Locked on Cougars. Maybe we're talking BYU quarterbacks tomorrow. Maybe we're talking more about Mark Pope. Who knows what it's going to hold? I've got plans tomorrow to play some more interviews I have from BYU Spring Balls wrap-up that we did. Uh, so if things permit we'll get to that tomorrow as well so a big thank you all the same for all of your support of the podcast i truly cannot do it without y'all i appreciate the thousands of you who download this watch it uh check it out on youtube also uh, listening to us via apple Podcasts, stitcher spotify you guys you guys know where you get it and i appreciate that please continue to subscribe rate and review and come back tomorrow right here on the podcast. Once again, thank you for making it your first listen of the day, as we often say, and thank you for being everydayers with us as well, right here on Locked on Cougars.